The following podcast is an audio version of the latest video, NG911 Future Makers. You can find the video version at www.ng911futuremakers.com. Thanks for listening and enjoy. Hey, it's Fletch. I'm Vice President of Public Safety Solutions at 911 Inform. This is the next episode in our new series, Next Generation 911 Future Makers, Building the Leaders of Tomorrow. Welcome to Next Generation 911 Future Makers. This week we're sitting down with the Deputy Director of Baldwin County, Alabama, 911, and that's Dan Wright. That's that's this week's Next Gen 911 Future Maker. Dan, welcome to the video podcast. Thank you, Fletch. Uh, It's an honor to be on with you. I hope it's okay if I call you Fletch. Absolutely. I, I tell people, the only people that call me Mark are my mother and people that I owe money to. So please call me Fletch. <laughs> so you've been in 911 for, for quite a few years. When did when did you first get started? Uh, uh, April this year would be 20 years. So it was uh, April of 2001. Wow. So I guess you could pretty much call this a career. Yes. <laughs> what drove you into 911? What was your driver? You know, I, I, I really don't, don't know. I drove you to work. I mean, what drove you <laughs> as, a, as a person? <laughs> so it was really a, a stepping stone to get into the fire service for me. Uh, but once I got into it, I just, I fell in love with everything 911. And, and while I did have a fire service career, uh, I never left 911 from, from day one. And so here I am in an executive level, uh, you know, being able to make a difference, in, in my opinion, in more lives than I was on the fire truck. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people look at 911 as a, as a gateway into public safety, whether it's being out in the road, being a firefighter, not so much, but even being a paramedic or so. Um, you know, that's that was their passion. And they got in the door on 911 because there was probably more turnover or more opportunities for change. And that's where they could get their, their foot in the door. So it's right. interesting to hear that you also got that way. But I also hear a lot of stories. Once I got in, I was hooked. <laughs> yep. Definitely was. I was, I was very fortunate in the agency I worked with. It was a small agency. So I was able to uh, interject myself in some, some GIS and technology stuff and got that. And, you know, I, I was already hooked, but once I got, into the back end side of things, it was it was even more, more passion and and drive to to do more to make a difference. You know, one of the things that's really critical in our industry, and something that I think a lot of people really don't think about, is that's the next generation of nine one one call takers and the you know are the data analysts as, as you called them when we were chatting just before. What is the next generation of nine one one call taker in your eyes? I don't know that we'll be able to coin them call takers very much longer. Uh, uh, event processors, maybe. I, they're, they're, I'm <laughs> sure there will be plenty of terms that, that come up uh, that we choose to use. But for me, it's it's about having this thought or this ability to think wholly, which is, in, in my opinion, going to require us at the PSAP level to teach our employees more on the side of what goes on in the field so that we are able to analyze the data that we do receive to, to get out and get the correct response going. You know, I've always had this um, thinking that in the future, at some point in time, once the industry writes itself with funding and salaries and job classifications, that What's going to happen is you're going to have what I call dual dispatching. And not on every call, but on some calls, based on the call type, based on the situation, you're actually going to have two call takers, pilot, co-pilot, if you will, on a particular incident, each focusing on specific tasks for that. And that's going to be because there's so much data coming in. It's going to be almost too much for one person to consume. There's too much to do to actuate the emergency response for one individual. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I can see that happening. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it, would, it would almost be as we do today in, in a call taking dispatching scenario. But I think just like you said, we'll add that third layer in there. And, and we, we may have the initial 
request for service receiver that can get the response started. And then we're going to have that the next level may be the data analyst that's analyzing all of that data. And then the third layer being the dispatcher or the emergency response coordinator. You know, how I guess in today's world, it'd be the dispatcher. Uh, the radio dispatcher would be kind of that third level. But yeah, I definitely buy into what you're saying. And, and, and it's going to require a, a different level of understanding and analysis to be able to process the data accurately. I think there's going to be an audio aspect to 911 service requests, and we'll, we'll call them that for, for just genericity. But um, there's always going to be an audio factor to that, and eventually there's going to be a video visual factor right. to that. And for a call taker, the person that's actually documenting the incident and trying to figure out what response is going to be, there's an additional piece where you're analyzing the audio, you're analyzing the video. What do I see in the background? What do I hear in the background? And I think there's an opportunity to use some technology where you enhance the audio for the call taker position to where it focuses on the voice frequencies. So the voice, the words, if you will, are as clear as they possibly can be and muted in the background the background noise. And then on the other position, you're enhancing the background noise and you're muting the audio, the verbal audio, so you can focus on, did I hear a glass break? Did I hear a shotgun cock? Did I hear a door slam? Uh, you know, and there's going to be that additional data side. Now, what do I see in the background? Is the, is the furniture toppled? You know, all of the indicators that are kind of there today uh, not the visual ones, but the audio ones certainly are. And the, the, the single position call taker has got to listen to the caller, document what's going on, and listen for all that background audio uh, coming in. Uh, that's that's a big ask. Yeah, I, I'll I'll push you a step further there, Fletch. I, I believe that we'll, I say soon, you know, using time references is probably not fair, but I believe we'll see a day to where we'll, introduce some augmented intelligence into that process and that we will receive an alert, if you will, of glass, you know, like a pop-up glass breakage, gunshot, or, or the, the uh, term weapon was used, or if we define these, these key indicators of, of what we need to pick up on, that it, it'll automatically either feed into whatever call-taking solution you're using or that you'll get a pop-up. That's, that makes you take action and saying, okay, you know, it may, it may be levels of those things that we get. So based on the severity and the parameters set at the local level. Yeah. And, and I've, I've absolutely agree with that a hundred percent. You can have a situation where I've got, you know, you got four call takers. I got five callers in queue. Somebody is waiting, right. To either be overflowed or answered. And while they're in that queue position, you're recording because you record trunk side and you detect a gunshot. What a great reason to escalate that call to the top of the queue. But like you said, if you're going to do that, you present to the call taker with the information and a big red bar says gunshot detected. Right. So if you're going 911, what's your, where's your emergency? Hello? Hello? And there's nobody there and you're looking at gunshot detected. That might be the reason why nobody's there. Exactly. It certainly changes, you know, the 911 hang up, the hoax call, if you will. You know, was it, uh, you know, is the temperature in the room 180 degrees? Well, that's why the person isn't there. Hell, it's on fire. I'm getting out right. of here. I'm not waiting. Right. You know, you, you can take that to, to what I see as one of the, the steps coming and, and all of that supplemental information is coming in. And, you know, while that, person may be in queue, you know, you're getting the updated uh, rapid SOS or wireless phase two, whatever uh, location technology we have at that time. And, you know, it's, it's almost like we would finally reach uh, uh, your local favorite pizza place of calling in. And when you, when, when you pick that, when we pick that call up, we can say, okay, I've got you at one, two, three, four main street. I see that you have a high temperature situation or, uh, you know, has anybody been shot or, what, whatever parameters we get that we have so much information before we pick that call up that the call processing process 
uh, the, the time has decreased and we have so much supplemental data that we that at times really don't even have to speak to anybody to be able to dispatch that call. I think it was Jameson Peavy House that I had on a few episodes ago that actually said that in the near future, we're going to see the number of device initiated calls outweigh the human dialed or initiated calls. Yeah, I, I, de- I definitely see that. I mean, uh, you know, again, not without putting the timeline on something, I mean, like, like you said, the voice part will always be there, but I, I can see, uh, I don't know the, the percentage, I, I think what I was going initially, but was the percentage of device activated calls would be uh, uh, comparable now today to wireline versus wireless. Uh, and it, it may not fully work out percentage based on that, but somewhere along those lines that, that we're going to get a lot more initiated device or device co- connected device calls versus a human dialing 911. If you and I could predict that number, we would both have different jobs and be exactly. a lot more money. <laughs> We know those numbers are going to be where they're going to be in relation to each other, but I'm not sure exactly what they're what they're going to be. But uh, but yeah, the trend is obviously there, and uh, you know it's just evolution of technology and how technology has changed. Um, what technology did you have available when you were first call taken? Did you have any alley? Did you have nine? Uh, yeah, we had, we had any alley, uh, and we had wireless phase one. Because back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we're talking 1980s, uh, early 80s. I was a dispatcher, and I had a I had a 10, 20 button, you know, telephone in front of me, with three different towns and lines, no caller ID, no nothing. The only computer I had was a big, big 3270 IBM console to do DMV <laughs> lookups, and if I wanted to look up case history i had to go into the records room right behind me pull open a file cabinet drawer and start thumbing through paper copies looking for different things and uh you know i think of what we accomplished back then and what could be accomplished today it's like just two different worlds and yeah i started with the 10 button phone we had we had any alley uh a, a doll space cad system and and no no mapping when I first started. It came right after I started. But uh yeah, it was it's it's amazing what we have today versus then. Well, I gotta I gotta admit, so you know, you know, Sparta Township in New Jersey had a wonderful mapping system. It was paper, it was about four feet across, <laughs> and it hung right on the wall behind me. <laughs> okay, I I I'll give you that. We had a paper map. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had and and this is this is an excellent example of people uh, understanding a need for something. Um, our fire chief <clears throat> was an airline pilot, so he had a lot of time off and a large stretch of days off. And he actually went through and compiled a book, page by page, where he documented every street in town and every house in town. It was about probably population was maybe... I'm going to say 14, 15,000 back then. But you had every house, every color for the entire town on about six or seven big, huge books. And wow. you could leaf through there and I could tell the responding unit, yep, yeah, it's three houses up from Windy Bush Lane intersection. Right hand side looks like it's, you know, last we know it's a greenhouse. Wow. And, uh, you know, now you could computerize that. That's I'm oh, yeah. sure that's on a layer somewhere. Oh yeah, you write, you know, write, or depending on your mapping system, you click and go to Google Maps and Street View, and you you got it right there. You know, that's I think one of the biggest changes in technology is that people are becoming more accepted of using commercial public applications. Uh, because of the accuracy that they hold, are they a hundred percent? No, or what they would what you would have considered public safety grade 10 years ago? No, but you know what? If it's the only thing you got, it's something. And the acceptance of that data has gotten a lot better, I think, over the past few years. Yeah, and I think we're going to have to open our our minds to, I, 
I use the term crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing to describe all of that technology or the things that, that the general public is using, and pretend, particularly in disaster situations. Uh, public safety, I, I think we it's been proven through multiple events that we've got to be more open to bringing in that crowdsourcing information because uh, once the 911 lines get flooded, n- no pun intended, uh, but once they get overloaded, then people still need help, and they're going to reach out to what they do on a daily basis, which today is either texting uh, or whatever social media platform they use at that particular time. So what do you think the most important initiative for public safety directors is today? People that are in your position, what changes can you get implemented that will move the needle or continue to move the needle forward for next generation 911? I think we have to stay focused on uh, not limiting the applications that are available, but the how, how we receive them. And... At the same time, in a parallel, we've got to hire right, train right, and uh, also bring up to speed or, or retrain our current personnel that are making careers out of this to uh, be able to analyze and capture and use this data that's coming in that uh, is, is, I believe, going to exponen- exponentially increase in the, in the coming months and years. Uh, and we, we've got to be able to manage that from a, a PSAP director level because we've got to, we st- the people in the chairs will never go away. And uh, that that's, I, I see, you know, I think the technology is going to happen uh, no, no matter what. The, the, the community, the public is demanding it. Uh, but we, we've got to stay focused on ourselves first, fully understanding what it's doing and what we have. Uh, the days of, well, you just just make it happen, just make it work. Or, or they're not going to be feasible any longer uh, for for me to push that down to the line level people and say, uh, just make it work. Uh, they're 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 looking at us to to provide them the proper training paths to understand what's going on. Nine one one has historically had a terrible turnover problem. PTSD, just stress of the job. The fact that the job is cut out for certain people and not cut out for others. I mean, you know, you, you all know the stories. People do a do a, a, a ride along with a call taker just to see what the job is about. They end up walking out and you never see that person again. Um, that high turnover rate. How much of a problem do you see that for you? And and what do you think is a is a potential fix for that i've been fortunate that uh well i have experienced high turnover rates but i you know i I do everything i can at my level to to take care of our people and and that is one of the hopefully uh one of my successes is that uh looking out for the people that that i work for uh meaning the dispatchers and <clears throat> Excuse me. As we move forward, that's going to become even more prevalent in what we do because right now it's it's a singular process. It's we react to everything. E- even in the chair, we react to a phone call or we react to a radio transmission or a text to nine one one. And in the future, we're going to have to be proactive and. Uh, I sound like beating a dead horse, but just processing that supplemental information that is constantly flowing in from a, a particular request for service. And your mind is, is right now the job's tough and we react to the things that we do. But, you know, if, if you need to get up and take a break, then that option is there in, in most lo- locations. Uh, but when that data is constantly flowing in, that it's going to be something all the time. So the human brain is, is going to be working more and processing more. So fatigue is going to set in faster and uh, mental health is going to become, uh, it already is <clears throat> a, a non-addressed issue in too many places, but we're going to have to ensure that for, as, as an industry that we're as leaders, we're taking care of our people. And I think that that's what it boils down to. 
Uh, and, and while that is probably not a very defined answer, uh, but everybody has their own version of how you take care of your people, making them feel welcome and making them feel safe, I, I think is probably one of the, the easiest ways to describe it is, is making them feel safe and cared for uh, when they come to work. You know, I, I hate to bring age into the discussion, but with technology, you've you've certainly got technology that the younger generation is more accustomed to. And, you know, my mother could never text and figure out what that is. <laughs> of course, she's way too far out of a career to be a 911 call taker. But how do you how do you handle the the evolution of technology in the center with your seasoned dispatchers? that know the job inside and out and can do it blindfolded without technology. And then your new dispatchers that were born with technology in their hands, their first tweet was out of their mother's womb. Hey world, I'm here. LOL. You know, I mean, how do you blend that together? So both sides can actually learn off each other. We're we're just going to have to recognize our people's strengths and weaknesses. You know, I, I can't take a, a 20 year dispatcher and say, well, you know, this is the way it is. You got to do it. I, I, we're we're going to have to be flexible in, in our operations to provide them a career path to finish their career. Uh, so at my previous organization, we had actually introduced uh, incident related imagery and we're, we're taking video calls uh, before I left there. And so the way I handled that, because I faced that, that same situation that you're speaking of is uh, it was a tool available to the call taker. So they could use it. It was highly encouraged to be used, but if you did not feel comfortable with it and you thought it was going to hinder your, your workflow and that you, it would just cause you too much stress, then you were not required to use it. So we're, I, that, that's how I'm going to approach it. Is it. It's going to be, now, will there be some things that have to be done? Yes, but uh, as a whole, we're just, life isn't fair. And, you know, I, I, those one or two year people that are, are told you've got to do this. They, if they, the shoes was on the opposite feet, they would feel the same way. And, uh, it goes back to taking care of your people. And, and, you know, I, I think there will be room to incorporate those older, more seasoned dispatchers in, into the roles because, uh, who better to be on the radio, uh, than the 20 year dispatcher, you know, telling the units what they've got. Yeah, it, it's a whole skill set of of analyzing a situation. And um, again, I think there's there's value for the skill sets they have. It's just identifying that skill set, categorizing it, and then utilizing it where it's best needed and, and not trying to jam that square peg into a round hole because the only thing you can do is going to shave the corners off right. your square peg. And that's not doing anybody any good. No, it, it, it's not. And you know, I guess I, I got a lot of people disagree with this, but I do have a soft spot in my heart uh, every once in a while. And, you know, it's just hard for me to to try to force somebody that's made a career out of this. And, you know, you think of somebody right now that's got 25 years in, just think of what the changes they've seen and already adapted to. And, and I really believe that, in, Again, not, without putting the time, but probably before their career ends, if they decide to finish their career out uh, in nine one one, that we're probably going to see two to three times as much change in the next several years as they've seen in a twenty year career. And I, you know, I even have a hard time processing what I've with the changes I've seen sometimes. And uh, you we just we just got to take care of our people. I, you know, I, I know I keep saying that, but I, I truly believe that. The, the people in the chairs was what make, makes this operation go around, and, and we've got to be willing to adapt to their needs. You know, I think in every interview that I've done, I've come away with, you know, I look for, and it's usually pretty easy to find, um, that one or two single messages that kind of wrap up the whole thing. And, and I've gotten that out of you as well, and it's that people will always be part of this chain of events. They're always going to be part of the process, and there's there's going to be a voice or an audio side that is always going to be there. That is not going to change. It's not. It's not there. You know, I, and I, I equate that just to what I've seen in the past 
five, six years with this text to 911 situation. You know, some of us, including me, I will be full disclosure. We're like, nope, stop. N- text to 911 is not going to work. We're not doing it. We're not doing it. You're one uh, of those guys. <laughs> well, and my main reason was because we fought so long to get location, and now we're going to text, and we're not getting location. Yeah. When it first started, that that was my that was my thing. Uh, but I we nine one one has done such a good job of call nine one one for so many years that in our experience, the and I think it's a nationwide uh, experience is our our the the fear and doomsday of we're going to be overloaded with thousands of text messages every hour is not yep. played out. And uh, we just to say all that to back up the point of we've done such a good job of call 911 that that will always be there. Yeah. And it, it's, it's hard to, for a technologist, it, it's hard to keep saying call 911 because you're not you're initiating a 911 session but forget it you're never going to get the world to adopt that kind of nomenclature for it. right it's call 911 right you might as well try to change the digits right <laughs> yeah and, and, you know, to that point i mean i you know how else do we tell people to get 911 other than call 911 so yeah. you know all these other things that are coming will be things that people aren't really initiating and which is it's what they're doing today is these connected devices are not generally being initiated by a human. It's things that are done automatically. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, uh, what do you think the biggest thing that you can do is to, to increase the longevity of your employees and, and give them the desire to stay on the job? What are you doing in that spot to, to foster that? Uh, first, you have to hire right. That's that's where it starts. And, and I think we fall short in a lot of places by not hiring the right people because we get so caught up and I got to fill the seats. So you've got to hire the right people, and it's a process. It's a, an extremely lengthy and tiring process to hire the right people. Uh, you've got to, and this is probably, I, I hate to place a, a different level of importance, but you've got to train them properly. Train, 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 train your people properly. And that is a continual process throughout their entire career. Uh, They've got to feel cared for and respected and wanted. And, you know, pay is important, but pay is not everything. Uh, Pay is is contingent upon uh, your region. And uh, while they, they do need to be compensated fairly because of the job they do, we're not going to solve the 911 staffing problem by pay because, you know, we, we could pay dispatchers uh, $200,000 a year and some just still just can't do the job. Professional athletes, you, I can't be a professional athlete and make a million dollars a year because I'm not a professional athlete. So we, we've got to hire right, train right, continually train, and just take care of your people. And more, when I say take care of, you know, we are all individuals. We have rules, we have policies, we have guidelines. Uh, but sometimes you have to have empathy and you have to apply that empathy to, to your people. It needs to be done fairly, which is very tough some days. Uh, but if, if we don't apply those principles, you'll never fully fill your chairs. I have been very fortunate that I have had staff that has held me accountable as a leader. Uh, when I left my previous agency at Chilton County 911, we were fully staffed and I had uh, some longevity in employees. Uh, and so uh, just uh, eight, nine months into my role here at Baldwin, uh, but we, you know, we have some, some long-term employees and I fully intend on, on keeping them here so long as they uh, meet our requirements. And You know, I hope that I'm sure some of my employees will listen to this. And if I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth, they will surely let me know. Uh, But I I hope that they feel cared for and and respected and that uh, I'm staying true to what my my intent is. And that's that's taking care of them and making them feel safe and providing them the tools they need to do their job. No, that's great, Dan. And and you heard it here first, folks. Dan Wright has said that there are opening call taker positions available at $200,000 a year. 
starting pay. So, well, I'm going to get emails on that one. So, you know, hightail it down to, to Baldwin County <laughs> and get your applications in. <laughs> you know what? But you're absolutely right. Money doesn't fix everything. And while, you know what, a 911 dispatcher in my eyes is is as important of a life-saving person as a doctor or a paramedic, a firefighter, anything. So you know what? You can put whatever number you want on there. It's never enough, but money doesn't fix everything. And I think that most people want to make a fair living. And if they make a fair living and if the job environment is conducive to be enjoyable, you know what? How many people that you know that have great jobs that say, I love working here? You know, I don't care what they pay me. I want to make a living and I want to support my family. But it's not about the money. It's about the environment and about the job and the satisfaction. You can provide that. That fixes more than money ever could fix. Yeah, I fully believe that. You know, I just I try to keep the mindset that I want to produce the environment that I want to work in. Uh, I still go out and, and sit with my crews when I can. Uh, I'm not doing it as much as I would like to, but I still can go work the console and, and well, well, always do that. So long as my role allows me to, uh, I don't want to forget where I came from. I came from the dispatch chair and, I, I truly, some days I miss call taking and dispatching. Uh, it's, it's a lot of, well, I better be careful in saying that. I was going to say it's a lot easier than what I have to do every day now sometimes, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I just really enjoy it, uh, and, I, and I, I want them to enjoy work. You know, I want people to have fun at work. We have rules. We have guidelines. We have expectations and all those adult things that we have to do. Uh, but, you know, I want people to come to work and be comfortable and feel safe and have a good time. And be proud to be there. Yes, yes, definitely. I, the, you know, if our employees can't be our number one recruitment tool and our cheerleaders for getting employees when we need them, I, I, I can't go out and do it. A Facebook post isn't going to, you know, get me uh, 200 applicants for a position. Uh, my employees should be recruiting. That's our number one recruitment tool is, is them talking about and being proud of where they work. You know, I think the social media side, the public awareness side is really critical. Um, you know, the uh, we're recording this, you know, mid to late January here. And just I believe it was yesterday. I was uh, cruising one through the Facebook uh, dispatchers group, and I ran across a post that said, "What a great day!" I just or I didn't say "What a great day," but you know, today I birthed my first child on a nine one one call, and it was a little baby boy, and I was elated as hell, and and I'm thinking, "Wow, how fantastic!" And then the next paragraph said, "But the baby stopped breathing, and when EMS arrived." The baby didn't make it. Oh, wow. And it was just such a high and such a low. I took that post and I spread that all over my non-public safety social media just to wake up the public and grab them by the neck and give them a good shake going, look at what people go through every day, the highs and the immediate lows that you just felt. For that person, now think about that person's got to go home to their family with that on their mind. And the person probably took whatever they needed as a little personal time to regain their composure and then was right back to 911, where's your emergency? Right. And worked the rest of that shift out. And I did that to raise awareness in the non-911 community. And I think that's really critical for our industry. We need to talk more about our accolades. And, um, you know, Karima Holmes in uh, Washington, D.C., OUC, you know, she has her agency put Facebook posts out about her employees and little small, simple accolades of employees that did a great job at work to get them out in front of the public. I don't know how much that helps. But what are you doing or, or what's your thought on, on on doing that from a local social awareness program? Uh, I'm 100% behind it. We, 
I have some ideas, and some of our staff has some ideas about what we want to do. But uh, yeah, we we definitely want to want to move toward more employee engagement and employee recognition type things. Uh, I, I really hate to use COVID as an excuse, but and it is what it is in our world. Uh, we're, we've had to be extremely careful and and in a silo with this whole COVID thing. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping we're about to turn the corner on that. But yeah, we 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 definitely have plans and intentions on, on getting our people more out in front. Uh, there's a lot of uh, directors in in the country that are doing amazing things, and you know, no need no use in reinventing the wheel on those things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we we've got to keep our people engaged. Uh, you know, firemen and police officers and EMS workers are, are heralded as the heroes because they've done a good job of that for so many years and and they're in the public eye directly right right they touch and, the and, public yeah you know we're we're not out there on the street so we've got to take advantage of these other tools to get our people out in front of the public and uh you know you you open yourself up to some uh criticism when you do that but you just got to take the good with the bad and you know actually at my previous agency we we used uh social media and got some informal complaints and we're able to correct some issues uh because people are going to speak their mind on social media keyboard warriors and uh but you know you just got to take the good with the bad on that and we're not ever going to make everybody happy unfortunately uh but until we get out in front of people and explain our processes uh then they'll never know actually i listened to the uh episode you did with Jameson uh, on the Ray Bombs Act on Rapid SOS and uh, right. uh, the gentleman from Collier County and his uh, Marco Island story about the PBX. Yep. You know, he, uh, he, he, he took advantage of that opportunity and corrected an issue. And, uh, you know, if that had not happened and been publicized, would they even know till still today that it was a problem? Well, you know, that was the whole, that was the whole push behind Carrie's law, right? How many people never thought that, oh my God, that's right. I've got to dial nine for an outside line and then 911. But everybody ingrains in your head every day. You got a problem? Call 911. You do want to do this? Call 911. But when it comes to an emergency situation in a hotel room with a nine year old, what's she going to do? Grab that phone and dial 911. But that doesn't work. And that right. was the tragedy. And I give the credit to Hank Hunt, who really, and I told Hank, I said, look, I'll get you in front of the right people that'll listen to your story and can activate some change. But I need you to tell this story. It was your daughter that was lost, not mine. And and that will that'll be the thing that grabs them by the neck and shakes them and go, hey, this is a problem. I buried my 31-year-old daughter. And sometimes it needs to be that plain speak that shakes people up. I took a lot of heat for that. You know, you, you need to soften the message a little. No, we don't. Right. There's a thirty year old, thirty one year old woman who's dead because of something stupid that can be easily fixed for nothing. An easy an easy programming change. Oh my god. You know, don't I'm, I'm not gonna, gonna get, get on that soapbox. <laughs> That gets me so fired up, and and I don't know if it's my my public safety career, you know what? It it just gets me fired up that people are misusing technology because of lack of awareness, yep. and it, and because of that, people are are dying. Uh, it just uh, it makes me crazy. But stop it, Dan! Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so let me shift gears a little bit. You know, public safety. And dispatching, it's got a lot of different models. Um, you know, when I was dispatching, I was, you know, dispatch was the local police department. We were dispatchers. We were special officers. I was a sworn officer, and I carried a weapon. I mean, you're Alabama. You guys carry weapons everywhere. But, you know, that, <laughs> sorry, I had to throw that in as a New Jersey guy. But, you know, I sat on the desk and I carried a weapon. Why? I don't know. Never, certainly never needed it. But, uh, but I was a sworn officer. And because of that, that was required because of NCIC access and the online databases and the criminal system. How is your agency in Baldwin County set up? Is public, is 
the 911 dispatch a function of the county sheriff or a police agency, or are you separate? In Baldwin County, we are a 911 district. We are a complete separate government entity outside of any law enforcement or fire service agency. Uh, we dispatch for 37 fire departments, career, combination, and volunteer. We dispatch for an EMS agency and a few small police departments that we contract with. Uh, but as far as organizational structure for us, we are a completely separate board that is appointed by the county commission, but we are a standalone government entity with our own budget, and our appointed board uh, is the uh, I guess, legislative body of, of our organization. Do you find that helps with the attitude problems that just trickle in, whether whether you're part of a fire department, you've got the, you know, you've got the that attitude coming in. If you're part of a police agency, you've got that mentality coming in. Being separate, does that help you kind of maintain your autonomy? I believe so. Uh, I worked uh, my my previous agency was, agency was set up the same way, and we were a consolidated piece out there. Uh, I believe it allows us to see a bigger picture uh, from from the 911 side, and we we are the only piece app in Baldwin County. So uh, I believe that it allows us to see a, a whole picture versus you know we we all tend to get comfortable where we work. So if we were a small PD or a, even a large PD. Uh, or, or a sheriff's office or a fire department, then we tend to only focus on what we do. And in our role here, we have to be fully aware of everybody's operations. And that puts a lot more pressure on us, of course, uh, but it allows us to have a, a more big picture mentality. What's the status of Next Gen 911 down in Alabama? Uh, you're going to make me misspeak. Uh, <clears throat> mostly fully implemented, I believe. I think there are only a handful of PSAPs that are not on the, what we call NGN, which is the Alabama Next Generation 911 Network. I believe there are only a handful of PSAPs that are not fully on NGN, and uh, there's some local technical or new product purchase things going on with that that's uh, just holding that up. Now, so you're receiving calls not on camera, not on analog. They're coming in via IP. You're getting additional data. Obviously, the origination networks have to generate that in order for you to receive that. But are you, are, other than increased wireless phase two accuracy, are you starting to see any other additional data coming in yet? Not, not yet. Not on the true 911 network. We're fully full user of uh, Rapid SOS jurisdiction view, so we're getting that data, but uh, not on the traditional or on the IP 911 network yet. So I think that's a point that a lot of people don't understand, you know, and I like to use television to equate to a a next generation 911 network. In order for me to get a high definition color video on my TV in the living room, I've obviously got to have a TV that's high def color in my living room. And then the television station has to be broadcasting a high def picture and it got to use a color camera to be capturing an image of something that is in color. And until you have all of that end to end, if any one piece is missing, I'm going to get a black and white picture on my high def color TV. And next gen is kind of the same way. So we've built the network. The peace apps are built. So the TV's there. The network is there. The TV station is there. And to some extent, the color cameras exist but they're not taking color pictures necessarily of color content yet. But right. uh, in Alabama, it sounds like the rest of it is all there, and it just takes it's going to take an origination network to generate the data, and then you're going to have it. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, uh, very proud of Alabama. You know, have we had the first nine one one call, and, and I'm very proud of the progress that's been made by the state nine one one board. Uh, to, to build this network out. Uh, and it's, it's been a long time in the, in the process. I mean, I remember back when I got started in the, the IT side and GIS side of 911 back in 09, 10, somewhere on there. And NGN was, you know, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming while well, it's here. And I think some are disappointed because they thought that once they were 
connected to Angie and they were going to get all these cool color stuff that you just talked about. And uh, unfortunately, uh, some of the other players are, are not as far along as we are, but we're, we're, we'll be ready when they get it ready. Well, that's the thing, you know. I mean, I mean, here in my office, you know, because I think I only paid two hundred bucks for it, but I got a fifty-inch high-def color TV hanging on the wall right there. If I put on A and E and watch a nineteen fifties I Love Lucy rerun, it's still going to be in black and white. Right. Doesn't matter what I got here, and and people need to understand that. Now, it doesn't mean that I can't receive that content. It just means that the content needs to be there to be received. And that's not always the case. And, um, you know, there was there was a lot of infighting, maybe infighting, just a lot of discussion. What part of the network do I build first? And my response is it doesn't matter because until it's all the way built, you're not going to have what your end goal is. So build what you can, where you can, how you can. And at some day in the future, and I'm not going to put a point timeline point on it, you will have Next Gen 911 when it's all completed. And and that's the best you can do. You're responsible for your little piece, and it's your responsibility to make sure you're not the hole in the chain or the broken exactly. link. And, so, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, I know there are some peace apps in the country that are having to do all that on their own, and, you know, I, I, I really feel for them because we're, we're lucky that ours is a statewide network, so uh, a lot of the work that goes into that is, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to deal with. We just let the vendor in and they take care of everything. You know, I think it's pretty cool that um, Alabama was the home of the very first 911 call, which is, uh, well, by the time this gets on, we're probably going to be pretty close to that date, which is February 16th, 2021. It'll be 53 years old. And here you guys are with the first next gen 911 network that was in place. And uh, I was down at the 50th anniversary in the uh, in Haleyville, and uh, actually had the honor of riding in the car with Steve Souter, uh, you know, in, in one of the uh, the lead cars of that parade. And uh, it was great to see a whole parade and a whole town come out for a parade, and and still only fill up about ten blocks. <laughs> it's such a small little town, but boy, I'm telling you, people that are just the salt of the earth. What a what an honor it was to be down there and. You know, I believe in karma. In 1998, long before uh, I really became an industry 911 person, uh, I still had my dispatch career, but I, I couldn't have even told you where the first 911 call had originated. Uh, on August 29th of 1998, my first daughter, my only daughter, she's still my first, uh, was born, and uh, I named her Haley. That that's awesome, you know. At, at, <laughs> don't know why. Maybe the light shone down and just ah. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think it's kind of cool. And and now, of course, I get to bust her chops and make her a part of every podcast and embarrass her. So, <laughs> what what else are dads for, right? <laughs> yeah. What else? What else are dads for? And the worst part about it is now she's down in just outside of Nashville, out in Clarksville. So she's got Jameson and Steve Martini right there next door. (laughs) So she's not getting away with nothing. And I remind her of that on every single podcast. So (laughs) And she used to go down to Alabama all the time, too. So (laughs) I've got the Southeast covered. There you go. (laughs) Well, that's, that's really great. So... What's one thing that of it? What's one word of advice you'll leave the the call takers for the future? What's your advice to somebody that's just getting in this industry and is still on the fence on whether they're going to hang out or not? It's going to change. Be open to change, but stay focused. If 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 you if you really enjoy your work, if you enjoy helping people, and if if you feel satisfied in the fact knowing that you on every call, no matter how minuscule of a difference you think you make, that person called you for a reason and you made a difference. You answered the call, you made a difference. Know that, take that to heart and be ready for the next call and just be open-minded about what's coming in 911. 
That's why you're a next gen nine one one future maker. Real quick before we wrap up, Dan, you've got a new podcast that you just launched. I do. It's uh, Public Safety Technology. Uh, only got a couple episodes out, but uh, getting it back going. Uh, twenty twenty shot it in the heart and killed it, but it's uh, it's, it's revived and back going. Uh, it's on uh, Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify, any of your uh, podcast wherever you listen to podcast. Uh, again, Public Safety Technology. So the the episodes of bit that I listened to were really great. You only made one mistake. Oh boy! You you brought Tracy Eldridge on your podcast. <laughs> oh, now I'm gonna take up for my girl Tracy now. <laughs> she's like a sister to me. I love breast busting her chops. <laughs> so she's doing really well. Again, she was my second next gen nine one one future maker, and it was the podcast that she that I listened to that you did with her. And I said, oh, I got to get Dan on here. This is, well, I, uh, he's, I certainly he's appreciate it. It's, it's an honor, Mark. Uh, I'm, excuse me. It's an honor, Fletch. I'm not, I'm not, you don't owe me any money. Uh, it's, it's, it's <laughs> definitely you're not an my honor mother. To, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely an honor to, to be able to chat with you and, and just to be, you know, for you to consider me in that role. And, and uh, I just, I, I hope that I don't lose sight of making a difference for people and, and encouraging and, and just being able to lead people and, and show them that, you know, this is, 911 is a great career. It's been extremely well to me. And, uh, you know, I just, I just love it. Well, thanks very much for being on with us. You gave a lot of people a lot of great information, beautiful insight into where Alabama is going with their next gen 911 network and the capabilities that you're bringing. And uh, a lot of good information on the industry and people in building, making, keeping and building that next generation of 911. So thanks for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Fletch. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps up this episode of Next Gen 911 Future Makers. Thanks so much for joining me today. This is Fletch. I'm the Vice President of Public Safety at 911 Inform. Remember to like and subscribe below and hit that bell to be notified whenever a new Future Makers podcast is published. Remember, you can subscribe to the audio version of this at www.ng911futuremakers.com. Once again, this is Fletch. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Fletch911. And you can check out the rest of my blogs and podcasts at www.fletch.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Stay safe, and we'll catch you next time.